Want to do better? Then it's time to change the story. Welcome to our show about new visions currently transforming the world through the confluence of art, tech, and innovation. And now your hosts, Michael Ashley and Neil Sahota. All right, welcome to another episode of Changing the Story. I'm really excited to meet our next guest, Anita Kay. She's a life coach, strategic talent manager, author, and Anita Kay offers progressive solutions to help her clients optimize their strengths, create a pathway of success. She's combined her expertise with her motivational techniques to create a unique and practical coaching philosophy. Her new book is Behaving Bravely, How to Mind Shift Life Challenges, and is currently available on Amazon. Definitely have to grab a copy of that. Welcome to the show, Anita. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Well, Anita, as a visionary, what is the story that you want to bring to the world? I would really like to help individuals know that they're not alone in any type of crises, trials, or personal professional tribulations. And my message is pretty simple. I like to help individuals um, by mind shifting our thoughts to staying in the highest element, which is in our courage and our bravery. That's wonderful. So we are currently living in a moment which does require a lot of courage and bravery. What is your advice to people who feel like it's more than they can handle at this moment? Yes, it really is a lot more than most of us can handle. And I think it's very simple yet very difficult. And I think what we really need to hone in on is going inward and knowing that we have more control over our fear and anxiety more than we think we do. And to not let the outside influences really dictate our plans, our dreams, um, progressing on what we have at hand, our work, our families, and so forth. So it really does take some sense of practice and patience right now. And it's really key to stay in that, you know, mind and mindset of optimism right now. That's fantastic. And I know that's a struggle. I mean, before COVID-19, you know, was it about 40% of the world actually already suffered from loneliness? It's like the biggest illness in the world. And I think these things are getting magnified. And I think obviously more people are having issues. I mean, Definitely. What, what should people be trying to do right now? How do they stay optimistic? You know, and, that, and that's a great question, Neil. And there's a difference, right, between, between self-isolation and loneliness. Right now, um, I think we're getting a, a lot of the two mixed up. And, it, you know, in my mind, and, you know, self-isolation is, is the physical distancing that we all have to practice right now. Whereas loneliness is a set of emotions that are associated with the thoughts of feeling trapped and feeling alone from others. And knowing that there's a difference between two is really, really imperative. Because while we're social distancing, we're still connecting. You know, that word social is really, really key and it manifests in every area of our lives. And that's really the choice that we have to stay within, is to stay, whether it's digitally connected, um, on our purpose, with the individuals that um, are keeping us afloat, through our work, even within our environments, um, it, it's really, really imperative that sometimes it's just simple by saying, hey, the, the negative connotation with social distancing is too much. It, it, it's, it's a constant reminder of what I, quote, can't have. But if I focus that and move it towards, no, but I can still social bridge with everything that I'm used to as much as possible, it kind of keeps us in the game. And it moves that fear and anxiety to a lower level, and it raises that self-awareness, which is really impactful and where we really need to stay right now. I love that constant social bridging. That's actually a smart way of putting yeah. it. It is. And so yeah. your book has, in the title of your book, you talk about mind shifting. And so right now, when so many businesses have been either shuttered or their, their reality is just very much changed, how would you suggest business owners and, and workers too, um, employees, how do they mind shift, to, mind shift to be successful in this new economy that we are dealing with right now? It's really important to go back to your why. 
why are we in business? What's our mission statement? What's our vision? What's our values? What's worked for us? What do we have the most pride in? And, and a lot of good companies, you know, that have successful brands um, and products and services, you know, say a lot of the similar things. They have an empowering corporate culture because of the talent that they bring into the organizations. And the leader and good leadership understands what that's about. And those things are still the key essentials that we really have to hone in on now. And what that translates to right now during the COVID-19 pandemic is, okay, what options do we have to keep that, you know, at the pinnacle of our business? Um, because although businesses are going to have to shift, um, where is that necessary and where do we really stay real? So, we, so we've got our customers and our relationships uh, really coming back for the right reasons. And I think, you know, we've been hearing a lot of wonderful things where employees are continuing to be advocates for their employees and they're coming up with creative ways to mind shift um, alternatives to those plan B's and those plan C's. What does that look like for each organization? It's very different. Some organizations are, you know, revamping their 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 risk aversion and 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 others and, and cutting costs there, where it's not impacting the employees' bottom line. Some are are so, some are having candid conversations and building the and further building their trust with their employees and coming up with creative compensation, you know, a reduction in compensation to. Um, you know, retain employment. So I, I think mind shifting is all about knowing your options. And again, I talk a lot about using our power of choice and not immediately jumping to the anxiety and, 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 and sometimes even the bottom line. I think we're seeing the authenticity of organizations and good leaders making some very hard decisions, but when they're keeping what's most important and that why at the forefront is 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 really telling and and, and and that's really what mind shifting is all about it's really moving to that plan b that plan c and evaluating the progress on the, along the way and going back to the drawing board what's working for us what's not working for us where do we minimize risk and where do we really maximize our potential and so staying there is the mind shifting that's going to continue to help during these difficult and uncertain times well makes a lot of sense let's you know let, but i know a lot of business owners right now they're trying to keep the lights on they're trying to survive mm -hmm. you know they're kind of in this panic mode how they start the mind shift i mean how they even going to get in this whole kind of mode it really starts with ourselves um, and the leaders are no are, are just as fearful as their employees, you know, they, you know, so I think it really has to start with yourself. And sometimes it's simple as acknowledging the problem or the crises or a piece of bad news immediately, accepting it, acknowledging it, and really understanding how that's going to impact. And, and, and that's without not really knowing your answer immediately. Once you move into that acceptance acknowledgement mode, like we do in our personal lives, it's time to take a pause and regroup and maybe whiteboard, brainstorm, um, you know, work with a strategic team and, and, and no options. And that really means mind shifting from, okay, I'm in, I'm, I understand I'm nervous about this to I've been through uncertainty before. The unknowns are not anything new, they're temporary. And for the next few moments, I'm gonna to commit to dot, dot, dot. Sometimes just getting through the moments and putting and, and coming up with new thoughts and new beliefs, right? They put you in that immediate relief. So then that's when you act, when you have the clarity. And when um, you have the clarity is when you can, when it's most beneficial to start those next action items or plans. I want to talk about behaving bravely, which is obviously the title of your book. Um, right now, I'm, I'm in Rancho Santa Margarita. I look out my window and it's, it looks like summer. It's warm. It's beautiful outside. Yes. And states are opening up and people are going back to normal. And so you mentioned uncertainty several times. Um, I think that people that have been going to the grocery stores, for instance, in the last few weeks, people are wearing masks, people are, are on guard, people are afraid. Um, even things that seem banal, like I said, like going grocery shopping, just getting in your car, going, going out seems frightening to a lot of people. How do we 
manage yeah. to, to be vulnerable, uh, as Brene Brown would suggest, uh, but also being brave and, and, and entering our world or re-entering our world um, the next few weeks, the next few months. With new thoughts and perspectives. Uh, and, and I love to say how to, by, by slowly taking a small step and building lion-like courage. Um, and that means, again, going back to, I have this thought, uh, what's my alternative? And I need to lead by example for my kids. And also, you know, seeking out the support. Hey, I'm scared. Hey, this doesn't feel right to me. Hey, I've had a moment of, a, of anxiety and I, I, don't want, I don't want my husband and my kids to find out because, you know, I, I'm, I'm keeping the family afloat. So it's really important to still have a support system, whether that's in the home or out, and it can even be with a stranger, um, but to really be cognizant of going out and, and, and chase the facts. What does this mean? Where are these triggers coming from? Where is the stress? Is it pinpointing that maybe the news is on too much at home? Maybe that, you know, Nelly, the neighbor is constantly coming over and sharing the latest statistics. So whatever that is, filtering that, making it a lower priority and understanding just like businesses do um, what's my vision for today and for my family and for what I need to get through and wherever I have gaps let me chase those facts down and stare the fear down by by chasing answers and resources sometimes pulling up a YouTube video and saying you know how to do a quick meditation could really put you in ease. So then you can get back into the car and an hour later, you know, or a half an hour later and, and take that step because now your state of mind is at ease. It's different. And so, you know, being cognizant of asking for help right now, and even if it's being self-resourceful to picking up that book or doing five jumping jacks or some breathing techniques, techniques or calling a friend or pulling up that YouTube video with your social motivating, you know, uh, author or, or, or even a spiritual teacher can be really a value. So it, it's really building along the way that courage, which takes time, but at least putting steps forward and building some type of practice, you'll eventually know what works for you or, or, or otherwise, and then keep to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually fantastic advice. I'm kind of curious because, you know, people are always talking about the days blending together and they're losing track of time, not just because you're just sitting around stuck at home, but some people are dealing with right. like a maelstrom, right? So many things are flying around. How do they even realize? I think sometimes they, I think they don't get it sometimes. How do, they realize, how do they realize or understand that things are going a zillion miles a minute? I got to just step back meditate, take some deep breaths, and actually do exactly what you're saying. How, how do you figure that, wait a second, I gotta hit the pause button. Yeah, you know, sometimes through trial and error, sometimes uh, it's taking, um, I didn't sleep all night, um, my body's now recognizing that, I feel fatigue, my body's recognizing that. Um, I had a shortness of breath, you know, the other day, I usually don't, I'm, I'm identifying some type of psychosomatic symptom that doesn't really resonate with me. So listening to your inner voice, going with your gut and self-regulating your emotional and your physical self will give you those insights and it'll pulse you through um, where you have to shift. So really going within doesn't mean you have to meditate like a yogi, but what it really means is listening to your you know, that, that inner voice or looking at the physical or emotional symptoms that you're experiencing and then taking a step from there. So it can be as simple as I didn't sleep last night to I'm noticing a different pattern in my eating or to I'm noticing that, you know, I have too much Zoom fatigue. I really don't really want to talk to anybody right now. That's really not me. Boy, I'm really recognizing that I've been feeling like that. And we're going on week three right now. So when you start understanding that your own behaviors are, are being modified, that maybe you don't recognize or it just doesn't feel good, um, then, then, then that's a key you know, insight to, okay, I recognize this and now what? By the way, I haven't heard that term before, Zoom fatigue. Uh, I'm, I like it. It makes sense because I feel like I feel yes, like that. Come yes. five o'clock every day, I'm like, whoa. 
<laughs> I've never I've never had a term for it before. So thank you. Um, I want to go back to oh, behavior. Sure. You mentioned a moment ago. Um, I think right now in this moment of uncertainty that there um, there's an opportunity for people to feel like well. Uh, the world is uncertain. I'm scared and I'm going to turn into something that makes me feel good. They're not going to look at meditation perhaps in this moment. They're going to look at something like drugs or alcohol or any other activities that probably it won't benefit them. How yeah. do you, how do you help a person that is thinking about turning to these things that just feels like, what's the point? Um, I don't know how to fill the, the time in my day. Anyway, I'm going to have a drink. It's only noon. What would you say to that person? These are the same um, go-tos, I would say, that people had even prior to the pandemic. When we go back and how we really deal with bad news, loss, uncertainty, financial devastation, relationships breaking down, I'm losing my self-confidence. Um, it's not something new that we haven't either dealt with and maybe that we, and maybe in the past when we had a setback, even a year ago, we dealt with it through maybe a bad habit. Um, drugs, alcohol, sex, uh, eating bad, what have you. And I think um, you really, when someone is not ready to hear about healthy alternative options and other perspectives, there's really nothing you can do but wait, wait and watch. And sometimes with our own selves, we almost have to go through those periods and those trials of hey, I'm going to escapism to these areas or I'm going to escape to this because it feels good. I'm going to band-aid my thoughts and, and, you know, and my breakup through you know, X, Y, Z. Um, the folks that have done that and know what that feels like will either A, keep doing it because it continues to feel good because there hasn't been a new light at the end of the tunnel. They haven't had a reason or they haven't hit a rock bottom. And others um, that are very self-aware of who they are and what works for them have graduated to more, like you said, the more meditative states or being very resourceful in their self-awareness. So again, exercising that power of, of choice, because that's really what it is. Um, I don't try to quote, none of us can really control or fix uh, a loved one or a colleague or even a friend that's that, that that really has a negative coping mechanism. But what we can do is be consistent with our kindness and our support. And when in the right, right frame of mind, offer things that have worked that are that, you know, that have been proven. I know for myself, you know, I have hit um, rock bottom in my life and, and my, and my book showcases those relatable stories of me and my clients and how we journeyed through them. And if, and it started out by coping with um, food, you know, and having been 45 pounds heavier than I am today and really succumbing to despair and feeling that nobody can understand. Once I hit a rock bottom or I had a health scare from a doctor was really when I decided I wanted to make a commitment and exercise a new belief, exercise a new choice, only then was I able to have a turnaround. So we, to some sense, we all know that high level, but to really experience the practicality of that is a really, it's an individual sport. But what I would say is, you know, coming from a place where I've been in, in some very difficult scenarios and didn't cope very, very strategically is I just message the same thing that you're not alone. And um, there are a lot of alternatives if, if, if asked and there, you know, you've really got to be ready. And I think that's the most important thing and the hardest thing. And, and mm -hmm. the most, the, the most difficult thing is, Hey, I've got a problem or, Hey, I'm tired of, I'm, I'm tired of being sick and tired and I really need a new mind shift. And what do I do next? You know, I'm, I'm kind of curious because I think you're really spot on on negative coping. Is there a way for us to train ourselves or make a conscious decision to say, rather than doing like the destructive or negative behavior, like reaching for that gallon of ice cream or reaching for that, you know, bottle of whiskey to actually try and reach for something that's a positive coping mechanism? I think, Neil, yes. Uh, only if you're ready, though. Only if you're ready. Sometimes the pain and the despair is so overwhelming that you know, all of our functional thought process goes out the window. Um, but if we put ourselves 
when we are, um, you know, alone with our thoughts and we all know our strengths and our weaknesses. And I, I kind of almost hate using those terms, um, but really that's what they are. And that black and white about us. And where does it come from, right? Where does it come from? Only then can we start putting steps before us to think about uh, making it, you know, making a change or moving from that environment or disassociating from those so-called friends or that job that doesn't fulfill us anymore. And, and I think that's an interesting point where I know for myself, when I started focusing inward, it became very purposeful. And, and, and it's not something that we all reach at 16 or 21 or even 50. But I hope that for most, like myself, there comes a point in time where we really contemplate who we are, why we do the things we do, where, where does that come from, and say, yep, I'm on track and I'm really happy with uh, continuing on in my journey, the way I think, the way I cope, the way I'm planning, or if not, making that choice and taking that detour that's the part where we've got to be really courageous and sometimes that means stepping away from loved ones our environment that job um a bad habit so it, it really keeps it really keeps chasing us back within because that's where all the answers really lie and until we are really uh one with ourselves it it, it just might be a longer journey those are all very important things that you that you brought up right there. I have a question for you. How, how do you uh, stay inspired, or what inspires you, especially in this moment right now? And uh, what would you recommend other people either see, watch, read uh, that would inspire them? That's an excellent question. What really inspires me is the individuals that I'm connected with: my daughter, my mom, um, my nieces and nephews. Um, and I always am cognizant that, you know, it, it's kind of like Santa's watching, you know, they're always watching me no matter what I say. It, it's more what I'm doing. It's those actions I'm performing. So I always think of kind of like a Santa Claus metaphor. It sounds kind of funny. But, you know, like when my daughter was little I would, and she would misbehave, I would be like, Santa's watching. Be careful. Santa's watching. Are you sure you want to, you know, you want to go there? And it would kind of put her in check. Maybe not the most positive, you know, behavioral reinforcement, but it, but, but it helps me as a parent because it, it really makes me understand um, I have a lot of value to offer young, young, you know, young people. And it's important that our future is well defined by those individuals. And so every person or every adult has the opportunity to shape a young person. So young people inspire me. My work inspires me. Um, I think doing purposeful work with care and knowing that why, uh, what's your vision behind it? What's your goal behind it? And it's past financial, it's, it's past um, you know, hierarchy. It, it really goes deep within. And I think how I, how I would share um, inspirational techniques or coaching techniques for others is, you know, engage maybe 30 minutes every day in learning something new, whether it's a new skill, maybe it's reading a, a story about someone that persevered through something, because those are the constant reminders that we're not alone. And, it, and, and we've got to model others. We have a independent but very healthy codependency on one another to some extent. And making those choices on who we want on a model and why helps shape that inspiration. And, and keeps us there or, or, or otherwise. Um, and I like to stay inspired and tell my clients with emotional and physical techniques, exercise through mindfulness, through, you know, through our physical bodies. Um, and, and, and I think learning too, you know, this is a very interesting time during the pandemic. It, it's not only a time of loss, but it's a time of opportunity. Can we learn one or two new skills out of this? Can we identify a new purpose? Can we, you know, ride that second hobby? Can we still dream for that planned vacation or our wedding? So I think staying inspired is very unique as far as what we want to stay inspired to, but the process of getting there are very tied to emotional well-balance, um, you know, physical um, uh, outlets and, and, and creative learning. It's really, it's really interesting because, you know, I've always said that mindset, attitude are so important and it seems like it's doubly so. I'm, I'm kind of curious, yes. 
very that you know, a lot of people talk about the best natural high that we can have as people is actually helping other people. We get the most amount of endorphins. It's the longest la- lasting. I'm kind of curious, is that actually a good way that if we're having trouble kind of self-retrospecting and trying to help ourselves, if we actually start helping other people, is that kind of a pathway to us being able to step back and be more mindful and do some of these, we'll call it healthy coping. I think that's, I, I don't even think, I believe that is the answer. Um, right now, extending a helping hand to the neighbor, to someone at the grocery store, to strangers, to our colleagues that are going through a lot, keeps you in that positive reinforcement for yourself. And that's where human beings, I believe, stay the most fulfilled, is when we're giving, we receive. And knowing that it's a personal and social responsibility to do so keeps us there. And yes, uh, Neil, 150% giving back is key right now. Not only do you discover so much joy in the opposing individual that you might do that kindness gesture for, but how it empowers you. And it's so interesting. I feel that just as a life coach, when I have a session or I volunteer um, as a coach to my philanthropy groups, I get so much more back than I feel like I ever gave. You know, a smile stays with me and makes my day. Um, And it's not about thank you. It's about feeling the gratitude that someone has trust in me that I have a little bit of credibility to offer. And I, I help somebody mind shift their thought from a difficult place to, uh, to a point where maybe they can see, um, uh, you know, farther down the road ahead. So yes, feeling, helping others and serving others, um, whether that's the power of the praying hands, extending your hand, lending a hand, is the absolute joy and the absolute answer and and how brave is that when we think about any superhero we always see the hands come for you know for first before any words so if we can use that metaphor sometimes um, um i think it's very very you know it's just a large beautiful metaphor that we can really count on i love that metaphor and i love what you're saying how can other people learn about what you're doing how can they get in touch with you as we conclude our, our session today Thank you. I would invite them to visit my website at www.anitaksolutions.com and you can buy my book there or visit Anita K on Amazon. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for social bridging with us and our (laughs) audience, Anita. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Stay safe and I tell the listeners to stay brave. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, if you like today's show, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you've been enjoying the Changing the Story podcast series, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you.